As a highly developed industrial state, Germany was dependent even in peacetime on external sources for the sufficient supply of oil. Even though Germany's 1938 oil consumption of little more than 44 million barrels was considerably less than Great Britain's 76 million barrels, Russia's 183 million barrels and the 1 billion barrels used by the United States, in wartime Germany's need for an adequate supply of liquid fuel would be absolutely essential for successful military operations on the ground and in the air. German oil supplies came from three different sources. Imports of crude oil from abroad, production by domestic oil fields and synthesis of petroleum products from coal. In 1938, of the total consumption of 44 million barrels, imports from overseas accounted for 28 million barrels, or roughly 60% of the total supply. An additional 3.8 million barrels were imported overland from European sources, and another 3.8 million barrels came from domestic oil production. The remainder of the total 9 million barrels were produced synthetically. As natural oil deposits in Germany were so few, long before the war efforts had been made to discover synthetic methods of producing oil. In view of the country's wealth of coal, it was logical to look in this direction for a solution. Both coal and petroleum are mixtures of hydrocarbons and the problem was how best and most efficiently to isolate these elements from the coal to transmute them into oil. By the time Hitler became Chancellor in 1933, several methods of achieving this were either available or in early stages of perfection. The most promising formula was the groundbreaking Fischer-Tropsch process. The process was developed by two German chemists, Franz Fischer and Hans Tropsch, in 1925. Under this system, Coal is compressed into gas, which is mixed with hydrogen. By placing this mixture in contact, ovens, and adding certain catalysts, all molecules are formed. Further treatment of this primary substance generates fuel, chiefly diesel oil. The Fischer-Tropsch process and an even better method the hydrogenation process changed coal directly into gasoline. When the Germans in the 1920s first began considering other sources of fuel, they did so for three different reasons. First, the blockade during World War I had told them how dependent they were on imports of a myriad of essential raw materials and how vulnerable this dependence made them. Second, because of the lost war and the ensuing economic difficulties, Germany was short of hard foreign exchange required for the purchase of foreign oil. And third, rumors were rampart in the world that proven reserves were about to run out. This last worry disappeared with new finds, but the second motive in particular, shortage of foreign exchange, remained and grew under Hitler. It was also Hitler's determination to make Germany independent from outside sources. In August of 1936, in response to a growing crisis in the German economy, caused by the strains of rearmament, 
Hitler issued the four-year plan memorandum ordering Hermann Göring to carry out the so-called four-year plan to have the German economy ready for the war within the next four years. The four-year plan was a series of economic measures initiated by Hitler in Germany in 1936. Hitler placed Hermann Göring in charge of these measures. His jurisdiction cut across the responsibilities of various cabinet ministers, including those of the Minister of Economics, Defense and the Minister of Agriculture. The primary purpose of the four-year plan was to provide for the rearmament of Germany and to prepare the country for self-sufficiency in four years from 1936 to 1940. Furthermore, Germany's leadership increasingly was concerned with the requirements of a war economy and after 1938 these concerns occupied a substantial position. Prior to this time, five hydrogenation plants had been constructed in central Germany. The total output of the plants in 1937 was 4.8 million barrels of various grades of petroleum fuels. Production goals were altered again in the summer of 1938 when Göring set up a new program whose completion was to coincide with the completion of rearmament in 1942. Greater armaments required larger amounts of fuel and the so-called revised economic production plan of 1938 reflected the new needs. Göring called for the production in 1942 of almost 88 million barrels of various types of fuels and lubricants. But it was not long before it was realized that a program of such dimensions would require construction steel quantities that simply were not available in an already stained economy. The shortage of both steel and manpower had delayed the completion of the fuel construction program of these plants. At the beginning of the war, seven plants were in operation, three were in advanced stages of construction, and two others were barely begun. Even the completion of the plants under construction was not pushed as much as might have been possible. The delay resulted from the competition of essential raw materials many of which needed by channeled directly into armaments and the optimistic of forecast by the high command. With respect to the first reason, Germany's armaments blanket was simply too thin when the war broke out and instead of broadening. Nevertheless, between 1938 and 1943, synthetic fuel output underwent a respectable growth from 10 million barrels to 36 million. The percentage of synthetic fuels compared to the yield from all resources grew from 22% to more than 50% in 1943. In spite of shortages and other difficulties, production and supply presented no serious problem until the spring of 1944. The first massive air raids were flown on the 12th of May 1944 and directed against five plants. Other raids followed and continued until the spring of 1945. The severity of the raids was immediately recognized by the German leadership. Between June of 1944 and January of 1945, Albert Speer directed five memorandums to Hitler, which left no doubt about the increasingly serious situation. Speer pointed out that the attacks in May and June 
had reduced the output of aviation fuel by 90%. It would require 6 to 8 weeks to make minimal repairs to resume production, but unless the refineries were protected by all possible means, coverage of the most urgent requirements of the armed forces could no longer be assured. An unbridgeable gap would be opened that must perforce have strategic consequences. Continued attacks also negatively influence the output of automotive gasoline, diesel fuel and methanol, the last was an essential ingredient in the production of powder and explosives. If, Speer warned, the attacks were sustained, production would sink further, the last remaining reserve stocks would be consumed, and the essential materials for the persecution of modern technologies would be lacking in the most important areas. In his final report, Speer noted that the undisturbed repair and operation of the plants were essential prerequisites for further supply, but the experience of recent months had shown that this was impossible under existing conditions. A perfect example of this was the amount of aviation fuel allotted to the training of pilots. Towards the last nine months of the war, they were sent into combat with only one third of the training hours actually required. At the peak of their synthetic fuel production in 1943, when half of their economy and their armed forces ran on synthetic fuel, the Germans produced more than 36 million barrels of fuel per year. At current rates, that quantity in this country would last all of four and a half days. I hope you enjoyed this episode and to make sure you don't miss my future work, please make sure you are subscribed to my channel and press the bell notification button. Thank you and see you in the next video.